I'm Ken Tate. I'm the Director of Engagement and External Relations for the Department of Computer Science. I hope you're here because you intend to be at the LabCorp Tech Leadership and Technology Speaker Series, right? Otherwise, you're in the wrong place. Uh, we welcome you tonight. Uh, we'll take this opportunity to ask anyone here from LabCorp. Sometimes we'll have representatives, uh, but we're going to say this anyway, even though they don't appear to be here. We thank them for picking up sponsorship of this particular speaker series. For those of you who may not know this, this series started out uh, 16, over 16 years ago as the Fidelity Investment Leadership uh, Speaker Series. And after 13 years with them and being sidelined with COVID, uh, it was reborn as the LabCorp series three years ago. So now we've had almost 100 speakers. Um, we designed this so that it would give not just computer science students, but also uh, honor students and students from across all disciplines here at NC State a glimpse into leadership and technology because it is quite a unique world. From time to time, we've had speakers on every potential technical topic that you could imagine. But this week, we are actually going to dive into a, a more non-technical topic. And I'd say it's going to be a little bit more uh, enlightening and applicable to everybody. And uh, I think that's why you're here. You probably already know that. So I'm just going to say before we get started, now's a great time to silence cell phones or turn off anything that might be a distraction. And I'll point out, too, that we are videotaping this. And we will have people on visiting us from online. So we welcome you from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, and if you happen to want to go back and look at some of the comments or look at the slides, we'll make those available on the speaker's page in the coming days, okay? So as way of introduction tonight, we are very, very happy to have with us uh, Suha Zell. And I'm not going to cover everything that's in her bio because I wouldn't be able to do it justice, but I do want to say this about Suha. She's a highly awarded executive leader, speaker, and contributor with over 35 years of experience in various industries, including technology, real estate, financial services, mortgage lending, business intelligence, higher education, and health research. She's the founder and senior advisor of Z Technology Solutions, where she helps her clients solve technology and innovation challenges, business intelligence, change management, leadership development, and other related projects. She serves on a variety of boards and is passionate about supporting and elevating others so that they can discover their own path of success. She's currently writing her first book on the fear advantage. So we're going to talk about fear tonight, but it's going to be a different kind of fear. Uh, Suha and her husband live in the Tampa Bay area, and they love to travel. They love scuba diving and experiencing new cultures and foods. And finally, and this makes me very happy, Suha is one of us. She got her degree right here from NC State in computer science. And so it is my honor to welcome you back home during homecoming week. So everyone, you please join me in welcoming our special guest speaker tonight, Sue Hazel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate that. Um, hopefully, you guys can hear me. Um, as Ken said, uh, my name is Sue Hazel, and I really am very grateful that you guys are here. I actually started right here, well, not this building, um, the computer science building was somewhere else. We shared it with the design um, school. And uh, that was back in 1982. Um, I was 16 years old when I started. And I was always fascinated by computer science. I knew nothing about computers, but knew that I wanted to learn more. And I was very fortunate that I was actually admitted into the program. Um, I know that Ken already talked about some of the housekeeping. I like this to be interactive, so there's some exercises in the presentation, there's some questions. Feel free, if you're confident, if you feel okay, shout it out, I don't, you know, I don't mind at all. I want us to actually get to know one another as well. I walk a lot and I use my hands a lot and I do have my notes because there's a lot here. Um, so our agenda is not very long, but we have a lot of content to cover. And as Ken said, this is really not going to be a technical talk. If you came here to find out about security and AI, infrastructure, DevOps, you're in the wrong place. Today we're talking about personal and professional development and how you can leverage the fear advantage yourself. Um, so we're going to go through just a little background, 
We're going to talk about why fear advantage. What, what made me come up with that methodology? What are the five ingredients? We'll finish up with some final thoughts. And then I've got some resources that I can share with you. And then, you know, of course, you're always welcome to um, ask any questions during, after, whatever. So, Ken already read my bio. I'm not going to bother, you, bother you with that or bore you with all the different details. But he had one thing wrong. I actually have close to 40 years of experience now. Yes, I'm aging myself, I know. Um, like I said, I started in 1983. And it was a very different world. We were just talking about it right now. And it's the way technology has changed and the way we handle technology as humans and how we can actually make ourselves better, not necessarily through all the different disciplines in technology, but how we leverage technology is very eye-opening for me. And Throughout my career, my career, I can tell you, I faced lots of challenges. You know, when you've been working for as long as I have been, it's not an easy ride. And you go through personal and professional challenges. And when you sit back and you reflect on those, one of the things that I always like to do is ask people, how would you describe me? What, what kind of person am I when you, look, when you think of me? Because I like to compare what, how I see myself and how others see me. And that's really part of that whole fear journey that we're going to talk about today. So here are some of the things that people talk about me. They say I'm fearless. Um, that was 10 years. I was 10 years old in Ghana, Africa, actually. Sometimes they say I'm lost. I gained a lot of weight back in the 90s, and I lost my way. Um, they say I'm a superwoman. I have two adult boys. They're 26 and 24 now. They keep me very, very busy. I'm also goofy. Um, this is one of my heroes. Her name is Marsha Davies. She's one of the most senior people in financial services. And I got the opportunity to actually interview her. And I don't know if you can see what's written on my forehead. It's a masking tape that says, number one super fan. And I still remember halfway through the interview, she's like, are you going to keep that on your forehead? I was like, yeah, because that's true. I am your number one super fan. I'm also a cover model. Um, I was actually um, featured on one of the business magazines, so kind of qualifies me as a cover model. And I'm also motivational. I do a lot of these speeches, a lot of these sessions in industry, outside of industry, um, speaking on both technology and non-technology, actually. So here's our first exercise. I see you all have your computers open. I want you to think of a word that describes you. Think of how others see you. Because when we finish here today, I want you to go back home and then ask your friends and your family to try and describe you with one word. And then look at the difference between the two. How do others see you and how do you see yourself? Because self-awareness is really key to how we leverage our fear advantage. Anybody want to share? Anybody can think of a word that they would describe themselves and want to share it with us? Fun. Fun. I like that one. Lucky. Lucky. Why are you lucky? Sometimes happens to me when I don't really do enough for it to happen. So nice. Good. Nice. Others? Yeah? Ambitious. Ambitious. That's a good one. And knowing your fear is really critical to your success, actually, of how you see yourself and how you proceed in the future. Anybody else before we move on? All right. Those are good. I like those. So why fear? Where did this fear advantage come from? As young professionals starting out, nobody sits you down and says, here's a blueprint of success. Do A, B, C. I mean, you're going to do great. I know nobody did that for me. No HR person sat down and said, you know, Suha, do all of this, and you're golden. None of my supervisors, none of my managers ever did that for me. And it was really hard. And I know you guys are, you know, some of you are going to start internships. Some of you are going to start working. 
It's hard when you don't know what you're supposed to do. So as I started to think back on how I felt at the time, and I realized that whenever I had challenges, whenever I was facing a pivotal moment in my life, and we all have them, sometimes they're internal, you do something that creates a path for you, and sometimes it's external, something happens, and your life changes direction. I realized that I always did the same thing. I had the same process that I went through to basically process what happened and think about why did it happen. And as I started to mentor and coach young people in the last few years, I realized this is something they're really challenged with. And so I started to evolve this fear advantage. It didn't happen overnight, but it really became something that I felt was solid, that I could actually share with people and help them understand how they can leverage this fear journey. So fear, five letters, an acronym, P-H-E-A-R. You can see what that stands for, purpose, heart, energy, action, and reflection. They're really five pieces of the puzzle that when you put them together, when you know your purpose, you lead with your heart, you create the energy, you follow through on your actions, and then you reflect, it is a powerful, powerful method to build your life and to move forward. They make you really who you are, and they're part of your North Star. So our next question is, who knows what a North Star is? Who wants to shout it out? Can't Google it or ask ChatGPT. Something that guides you. Something that guides you. The real basic definition of what a North Star is, it's a light in the dark sky that helps you navigate. That's the very basic definition. But what's interesting about it is it's in the dark and it's a light that guides you, as you said, that gives you direction. And that's what the fear advantage is going to do. It's going to create this North Star for you that as you move forward in your careers, in your lives, that's going to be your guiding light that shows you how to navigate what's going on in your life. So let's dive in. We're going to come back to, there's three questions on this that we're going to come back to at the end of the presentation. What is working for me right now? What isn't working for me and what am I missing? Because sometimes we have blinders on and we don't really see what's going on. And what can I do about it? Once we go through the fear journey, we'll show what, how these three questions actually play into who you are going to become. So, as we dive in, the first letter is the P, and as I said, P is for purpose. I'm sure you all know who Steve Jobs is, right? I'm not that old, much older than you guys. <laughs> you can read, you guys are college students. I'm not gonna read it for you. But what Steve is saying is there are two important things. One, we have to know who we are. And two, we have to know what we want our legacy to be. Those two things create your purpose. Who you are and what you want your legacy to be. So think about that for a minute. It's, it's very simple, but it's also time. It takes time to learn who we are, what matters to us, what guides us every day. And so as we begin to look at this, your purpose and your why, they become a part of your DNA. And to know what they, what they mean to you, you have to spend the time. There's a lot, this, this journey, there's a lot of introspection. There's a lot of things that you have to do by yourself. Sit in a quiet room and think and, and really ponder serious questions. And to know who you are and what really moves you, you have to take the time to do that. It's not something that, oh, this is what I care about. 
I know we all care about NC State, we all care about the Wolf Pack, go Pack, woo -hoo. But that's not really what we're talking about here, right? And Simon Sinek, how many people have heard of Simon Sinek? All right, so he's famous for his start with why. Because when you start with why, you start from the inside and you find out what really matters. If you know the golden circles that Simon Sinek talks about, he talks about the what, the how, and the why. There are three circles, one inside the other. Why is in the, in the middle, how is the next one out, and the furthest one out is what. And what happens is a lot of people focus on the what and work inwards into the why. And the why is your purpose. And Simon Sinek says, uh-uh, that's the wrong way to do it. You have to start with the inside, figure out what's really important, and then you work your way out of that. So you figure out what's, what's really important, the why. Then you figure out the how. Then you, then you try to figure out what, the what that you need to do. But if you start with the what, you're missing the real important clue, the why you're doing what you're doing. And so to, to, to start with your why, you have to know what your core values are. You have to know what your superpower is because those two things define and help you create that purpose that's gonna guide you as you move forward. And that's actually gonna be our next exercise. Everyone has a superpower. I'll tell you, my superpower is being me. That's my superpower. That's what I bring to the table. Do you know what your superpower is? Have you ever thought about that? Are you a connector? Are you somebody that makes people laugh all the time? Are you, I mean, those are all good qualities to have, but you need to know what they are because they do define your purpose when you, when you trickle down to it. So think about it. Anybody wants to share with us if you think you know your superpower? Googling stuff, that's not kind of a superpower, <laughs> but I'll give it to you a little bit. Yep. Get stuff done. Get stuff done. G hashtag GSD, if, you, if you're on LinkedIn, you probably see that all the time. His superpower is he gets stuff done. Actually, it's, there's another S, but yeah. we won't <laughs> mention that here. We're being taped live. So you really need to know what your superpower is. So. We've taken the time, we've sat in a quiet room, we've figured out what our core values are, what our superpower is. We kind of have defined our purpose. And once we do that, we can move to the next step and write our why statement. Your personal why statement really defines two parts. You've got the contribution, what you want to do, which goes back to Steve's job for the first thing, it's based on who we are. Because what we contribute is based on who we are. And then the impact, what we want our legacy to be. So I want to, whatever it is that you want to do, so that whatever legacy, whatever impact you want to have. And my why statement is right up there. I want to awaken and inspire every one of you so you can thrive, so you can live your best life. And if I've done that, then I've done my why. I fulfilled my why. That's what I want to do. So your other exercise that you're gonna do when you go back to your dorm room or apartment or home is think about this. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you want your legacy to be? Can you write your own why statement when you think about it? Again, a why statement will change. It may not remain the same over time as you mature, but your core values don't change. What matters to you won't change. The why won't change. But as you evolve, you will be able to do, to come up with other why statements. You guys are either really, really bored or enthralled by what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. So 
we're going to move into the next one, which is the H. And H is for heart. Do you like my little cheerleaders? I searched, I googled high and low to find something that I could put there. What is Miss Angelou telling us here in, the, in this statement? I know you've all heard it. It's, everybody says this. What she's saying is really one thing. People want to be seen, want to be heard, and want to be appreciated. They'll forget what you said, and they'll forget what you did. But how you made them feel, you made them feel heard, you made them feel seen, you made them feel appreciated, they will never forget that. How many, how many people saw Avatar? The first one, not the second one. Second one's really bad. <laughs> if you remember the scene where Neytiri tells Jake Sully, I see you, how powerful was that moment? She saw him, she heard him, and she appreciated him. And you could feel the energy between them from that moment. I see you. Those are powerful words to tell someone. So, I know you've all heard the statement leading from the heart. What does that really mean when someone is leading from the heart, you think? They wear their heart on their sleeve? I'm sorry? There, that's honesty is a huge part of leading from the heart. Yes, absolutely. Anyone else? There's a lot of intuition with leading from the heart. We're going to actually talk about that a little bit. Compassion. Compassion. Very true. When you're leading from the heart, it really is about making it about the other person. It's no longer about you. It's about making sure that that other person, I want to awaken and inspire you. I'm making it about you. It's not about me. I want to make sure that you have the tools that you need so that you can succeed, so that you can thrive, you can have a good life. And so when I'm leading from the heart, I'm genuine, I'm authentic, but I'm vulnerable. I'm empathetic and sympathetic, which is two very different things. I also show compassion when I'm leading from the heart. I listen. I really listen. It's not about me. I want to hear your story. Am I interested or am I interesting? Very different connotations to those words. When you're interesting, it's about you. I want to show you how interesting I am and I do all this cool stuff. But when I'm interested, that means I'm sitting here, I'm listening to you, I'm watching you, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm appreciating what you're telling me. And I'm making it about you, not about me. And those are really key key methods that you, when you embrace that, you're on your way to the fear journey. You're halfway there. Because a lot of people don't listen. They, they're, they're, they're forming the words in their mind so that they can respond to you without listening to what you're saying. Because that's what they're caring about, is how am I going to answer this? So they're all, they're, they've stopped listening to what you're saying. And it's about giving. When you're leading from the heart, it's about giving. It's about being other-centered. Whereas if you're always taking, 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 that's self-centered. And that's the difference between the two, between leading from the heart and those who don't lead from the heart. Sometimes they refer to it as a servant leader. I don't like that term that much, but it really is. It's about making it about you, the other person in the equation, and how we can support you so that you can succeed. So, um, 
I do this sometimes as a four-hour workshop, and we actually sit and do these homeworks in the workshop itself. We're not gonna do that here. But these are things that you know, I would love for you to take away and think about it. This is one of the most powerful ones that we did. Um, we did this with a group of, of mentees, and we asked them to think of someone that exemplified leading from the heart, someone that really impacted them. And then we asked them to either write a letter, not an email, handwritten, or give them a phone call and tell them why they, they mean so much to them, what they did, how they impacted their life. And then we asked them to come back and tell us what happened. And it was very, very powerful to watch those, those mentees actually describe you know, the, the joy that the other person received when they got the phone call or got the letter and then reached out to them to let them know. Very powerful. So try to think about that. Try to do that for someone. Because again, it goes back to they want to be heard, they want to be seen, and they want to be appreciated. And now we go to the E, back to Simon Sinek. When we think back of the heart, we talked about putting others first, right? We said it's about making it about them, not about us. Because we want to make them feel seen, heard, and appreciated. When we do that, we elevate and empower the other person. So think of two other E's. At one point, I actually had E squared in there because I thought it was really important to talk about the empowerment and, the, and how we elevate others. Because leadership, whatever you think leadership is, I'm not talking about the head of a company. I'm not talking about your manager. We are all leaders. We all lead in one way or another. We lead ourselves, that's the first person we lead. We lead our kids once you have kids. And at some point you will lead your parents when they grow older. We're all leaders, and then you have leadership in a professional sense. Leadership is about empowering others, and those last six words are so important, to achieve what they did not think they can achieve. Think of how powerful when you walk away tomorrow and you think about this and you go, wow, I think I can do this. Again. I want to awaken and inspire you. And that means I'm fulfilling my why if I'm giving you that tool so that you can succeed and do what you need to do. And when we start to do this, when we start to elevate and empower others, we actually start to create energy. How many people have heard of pay it forward? Most of you have. When somebody does something nice for you, you turn around and do something nice for somebody else, they turn around and do something nice for someone else, and it creates that positive energy, that momentum, that then creates this buildup of acknowledgement and of ability through that positive energy. Now, Part of the energy that we create is those who we surround ourselves with. So think about the people that you hang out with. Are they mostly pessimistic, unhappy, complainers, people who are really half is always, you know, the glass is always half empty, they're not happy with anything? Or do you surround yourself with people who are grateful, happy, positive, most of us have people that are from both games, for both sides. Think about how you feel when you're around somebody who's pessimistic and down and complains all the time. How does that make you feel? And do you find yourself complaining and more negative and more pessimistic? And then think about the person who's really positive that you hang out with and how do you feel after spending time with them? So the energy that we create that creates that combustion, if you will, could either be negative energy or it could be positive energy. 
and you really want to surround yourself with people who are going to make you feel happy and grateful, who are actually adding to your growth, not bringing you down. So this is the second homework that we do. Because part of the, the, the fear journey is actually creating what I like to call your personal board of directors. We all know what a board of directors is, right? They're people who advise companies. So your personal board of directors are gonna be people who advise you, that help you. And typically, I recommend people who can fall into these categories. The cheerleader is the one that's always gonna be cheering you on. They've got your back, they're behind you, they're always there for you. The devil's advocate and or the truth teller is the one that's gonna challenge you all the time. That's gonna make you think outside the box. I hate that phrase. Think outside the box. Think differently is better, is better way to put it. That's gonna tell you the truth even if it hurts. No, Suha, you're wrong. That was not the right thing to do. You overstepped here. You should have thought more about what you were gonna say. They're always gonna be honest and truthful with you. The one who knew you when, this one is really important because they ground you. They're the ones who knew you when you were in elementary school and were getting into trouble. And when you start to get on your high horse about things, they're like, I knew you when. I know what you were like. Don't give me that BS. And the outsider, if you typically hang out with the same kind of people, um, sometimes it's a good idea to bring in somebody that's a little unfamiliar because they're gonna give you a different perspective. They're gonna give you, they're gonna see things with a different lens and help you see it in that different lens at the same time. And this is one of my favorite ones, the one you want to be. I'm not saying, you know, like kidnap them or anything like that, but it's somebody who you admire, somebody who may be further along in their career than you, somebody who can take a mentorship role for you because they can guide you. They've been where you were and you want to be like them. You want someone like that on your personal board of directors. Any questions about this? You guys are very quiet. When the board of directors get together, though, are you just kind of describing a network of mentors? Not necessarily just mentors because your cheerleader is not necessarily gonna be a mentor. That may be more of a colleague or a peer. The mentor I see is the one that could be the outsider or the one that you want to emulate, the one that you want to be like. The truth teller is probably one of your closest friends as an adult because they're the ones that are not gonna put up with any BS from you. And I personally, in my circle, you know, whether you wanna call it a tribe or a circle or a board of directors, you can give it whatever call, whatever name you want to, we actually get together at least once a month on a Zoom. Some of us are actually in the same city. We'll get together for coffee or something, adult beverages, whatever. But it, it's important to keep that connection. It's not like you're gonna, oh, hey, will you be on my board of directors? Great, thanks, all right, see you next year. That's not what it's about. You actually wanna stay in touch. You wanna connect with them. When you have issues, when they're there to celebrate your wins, and they're there to cheer you on when things are not going the way you want them to go and to give you advice. And so you want to stay connected with them on a regular basis. I don't know if that answers your question. All right. This is actually my favorite. And you can tell it's my favorite because I have two quotes on it. I love action. Action is when we get things done. And so, We've defined our purpose. We know our core values, we know our superhero, we know what our, what our superhero power is. We've gone through, how am I gonna lead with my heart? How am I gonna make this about others? How am I gonna elevate them and create that positive energy so that we can all succeed together? And now we get to the A, the action. And this is where a lot of people actually, I don't wanna say fail, but don't follow through. One of my coaches, her name is Bronwyn Morrissey, um, she once told me, 
Dreams without action remain dreams. Dreams with action have the potential to become reality. So we could sit here and do, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. But five years ago, I wanted to write the book, and I never did anything about it until Bronwyn's like, Suha, this is a pipe dream until you start doing something about it. So if you want to get something done, you have to do something about it. And that's what Emilia and how many people know Napoleon Hill? Oh my God, okay, you guys need to read him. Really, re you need to read him. He's amazing. Um, he's written some really amazing personal development business books that are very enlightening. Um, what they're both saying is that you have to take that first step. And then you have to manifest, you have to imagine the reality that you want and then put the work. It's not just going to happen. You know, we all want to win the lottery, but the chances of winning the lottery are what, one in like 300 million people? So unless you do the work, your, your dream is going to remain a dream. Whatever the mind can conceive, the mind can, can, can achieve. Those are powerful, powerful words. That's, where the, that's when you manifest, you start thinking about it, you start almost dreaming about it, and you start putting things into action because you, this, you are so passionate about this that it means so much to you. And once you start doing the action, once you start doing things, it becomes easier. It's that taking that first step, turning one day into day one. Think about those words. How many of us sit on the sofa and say, tomorrow I'll do blah, 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 or one day I'm going to do blah, 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 and then we never do anything about it? But if today is the day that I take that first step, I take that first action, I write that first word in my book. My first book was, hello, my name is Suha. <laughs> but I wrote the first word. I took that first step. Once you do that, once you turn that one day into day one, and you start taking those incremental steps, and you know what? Have audacious goals. Back in 1968, 69, when we were trying to get to the moon, that was a huge audacious goal. Huge. Did they succeed on the first try? Did they say, oh, we're going to go to the moon, and they did it tomorrow? No. There's a lot of hard work that went into that. And the same thing, have those big audacious dreams, but make sure that you follow through on them and that you have a plan, that you have an action plan that helps to guide you through those steps as you go along. I think I missed my part here. I went on a tangent, sorry. So we talked about turning one day into day one and making sure that we're following through and that we have an action plan. We talked about having audacious goals. For me, writing a book was a huge audacious goal. I, I still you know, think, what the heck? What was I thinking about? But once I put it out there, once I said I'm going to do this, that alone propelled me to actually start writing. That alone held me accountable, if you will, another A. Because without accountability and without commitment, again, you're not going to follow through. Always keep this in mind, though. You cannot run before you walk, before you crawl. You have to start somewhere, and you have to start small and build until you can run. I can't say, so running a marathon is also one of my audacious goals, and I'm nowhere near running a marathon, but I can't say I'm going to run a marathon and go run it tomorrow. You have to put in the work. So you have to actually, sorry, there's a fly here. Don't try to conquer the world in one day. Don't try to do it all in one day. It's not going to work. Okay, she really likes me, I think. <laughs> because then you're setting yourself up 
not necessarily for failure, but you're setting yourself up for disappointment at a minimum. What you want to do is you want to, to create that action plan with small incremental actions that build to this big audacious goal that you've set yourself. I think Ariana Huffington calls it micro steps. Because when you think of how good you feel when I got this done, I got this done, this is completed. And you start to see the progress. I had 100 things that I had to do and I've completed 70 of them. That's pretty good, I'm, I'm moving at a good pace as opposed to I've gotta do all this and then I sit and watch TV. How many of you procrastinate when you have homework or you have to study for an exam? I did that all the time, all the time. And I know it's, it's easy to just say I'm gonna do that later, I'm gonna do that later. And as we begin to take action and sometimes face disappointment, we have to embrace that we are going to fail sometimes. And failure is not a bad thing. Failure has a really bad rap. People think that if you fail, that you're a failure. You failed at something. It doesn't make you a failure. And actually, we learn from our failures. How many times did it take Thomas Edison to create the light bulb? Does anybody know here? Have you guys read that? It took him 995 tries. He did not succeed on the first time or the second or the third. 995, I think that's the number. So we have to embrace that failure. We have to embrace that sometimes we don't know everything that we think we know. And that we're gonna have this learning journey as we're going through the fear advantage journey. John Maxwell, another really good author, if you haven't read him, you should, wrote a great book called Failing Forward. Most people think that if I fail, I'm gonna take steps back. I'm gonna fall behind four or five or six or 10 steps. And John in his book actually disagrees with that notion. He says, no, in fact, when you fail, you are failing forward because now you're gonna learn from that failure and do it better next time. And you may fail again and you'll fail forward again and learn again until you actually get really good at it and you do and accomplish what you wanted to do and accomplish. But taking actions is not easy, really. I mean, we have so many obstacles that stop us from taking action. And I wanna talk about a couple of those challenges and then we're gonna talk about a couple of ways that we can overcome that procrastination or that, that inability to act on something we want to do. The first one is fear. F-E-A-R, not P-H-E-A-R. Our brains are not wired to accept change. Actually, our brains are wired to protect us when it thinks we're gonna do something stupid. And when you're looking to do something new and different, your brain thinks, uh-uh, Suha, what are you doing? No, 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 go sit on the sofa today. You're not gonna do that. That's not good for you. And so we have to find ways to overcome that fear because fear is gonna stop us from taking those steps that we want to take to accomplish what we want. And then the other one that stops us is the inner critic. Mine sits right here. Her name is Suella and she always whispers in my ear, you're so dumb, what are you doing? Why do these people wanna come and listen to you talk? Do you have a voice like that in your head? that tells you that you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what you're saying or you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that and that you should be quiet. Yeah, she's right here, I can feel her. Your inner critic or your, or, you know, some people call it imposter syndrome. They're interchangeable, but I like to think of it as my inner critic. That has held me back so many times. Those two things, fear and my inner critic, has held me back so many times from things I wanted to do. On the flip side, there are ways to overcome those challenges and those obstacles. And I'm gonna talk about two of them. One is kind of fun, actually, the beginner's mind. And the other one is not so sexy, 
time blocking. Who knows what a beginner's mind is? Or can give me an example of that? I actually wrote an article about it. If you go on LinkedIn and you Google and you search for me, you'll see I actually wrote a whole article on, on, uh, on beginner's mind. Do you remember when you were a child? When you were like two, three years old? And you were running all over the place, and your parents were behind you trying to protect you. They put things around the desk, so, around the table, so that you wouldn't hurt yourself. But you wanted to taste everything. You wanted to learn everything. You were curious. Your eyes were open. You were excited. That's what a beginner's mind is. Somebody who's open for any new experience, for learning any new thing that comes their way. They're not hindered by obstacles or things thoughts or perceptions or, oh my God, what are you going to think if I do this? Um, about a year ago when I started to, I used to wear high heels all the time at conferences, by the way. My feet hated me. And about a year ago, I started to wear these sparkly shoes. Aren't they nice? Yes, they are. And I can't tell you how many people, at first I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm just wearing sneakers at a conference? Everybody's in business suits. I can't tell you how many women have stopped me and asked me, that's such a great idea. And now every conference I go to, most of the women are wearing sneakers. We actually have something we call the sisterhood of shiny shoes. <laughs> and we take pictures of them together. Again, be open. Be open to new ideas. Be open to new things. Don't have a closed mind. Approach everything with that curiosity. Remember how, how exciting, that first time you took a lick of ice cream when you were three years old, how exciting was that? That's what you want to have when you're trying to take action. Because when you start with a beginner's mind, you are leaving yourself open to so much more. The other one that's not so sexy is time blocking. How many here really understand what time blocking is about, or the, t the Pomodoro technique, or zero in box, or whatever they want to call them these days. Got a couple of people that raised their hand. Time blocking is really essential. You know why? So this is actually one of the exercises that we do in the workshop. Every day, you start every day with this number, 1440. Who can tell me what that is? Number of minutes in a day. That's how many minutes you have every day. Whatever you're going to do, that's how many minutes you have. And we all think, oh, I have plenty of time. I can get this done, no problem. So we ask people to sit down and actually account for everything that they do each day. And we ask them to do it for a whole week. Because, you know, your days are different. Monday, Wednesday, Friday for students, you've got classes that are different from Tuesday, Thursday. You've got to go to the gym. Um, you're going to meet your friends for drinks or for lunch or whatever. You're going to sleep, hopefully, at some th For me, sleep is the biggest one. I sleep eight hours a day. No question. If I don't sleep eight hours a day, I'm, I do not operate. I drink a lot of coffee, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> so, Try, if you are interested, again, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to send you this. You can see what it looks like. Account for everything that you're doing in a day. Figure out what your ending balance is. When I, the first time I did this, I was negative 600. Negative 600, because I thought I had all the time in the world, and I could do anything in those 14, 40 minutes. This exercise is a real eye-opener for people because you don't think of the things that you have to do. You're on a bus. There's an accident. You didn't get home for two hours. That's how many minutes? Come on, guys, you're computer science people. <laughs> that you lost that day, that you were supposed to do something else, right? So time blocking becomes important. I use my calendar like it's my best friend. I time block everything. My husband thinks I'm really crazy because I also time block like when I'm going to take my shower, when I'm going to make dinner, when I'm going to do certain things. And he just looks at me he's like, why? Because I know myself. I, will pro I am a procrastinator. By nature, I will sit and you know, I'll watch TV. Survivor, I'm a huge Survivor fan. 
Um, so if I don't do that, if I don't force myself to be organized, it's going to turn into chaos. How many people are really good at organizing their time? I'd be interested to see. One. We only had one person raise their hand. That's not good. Yeah. <sighs> All right. So we're coming to our last letter in the journey, the R. And this is, whereas action is my most favorite one, this is the most difficult one. I will be very honest with you. Brene Brown is another great author. If you've read any of her books, uh, if you haven't, look her up. She's written a tremendous amount of work, very meaningful work, with a lot of research behind it. The most powerful teaching moments are the ones where you screw up. What were we talking about John Maxwell a little while ago? What did we say about him? What was his book? Failing Forward. That's what she's talking about. When we fail, that's when we learn the most. That's exactly what she's talking about. That's when growth happens. That's when you sit back and you go, huh, OK. Now I see. I understand. So we said it was the toughest one, but that's where the, the growth most occurs. And so what's stopping us from reflecting? Why do we not like to reflect? Anybody care to venture a guess? I mean, I told you it was hard, but why is it hard? What is it that you have to acknowledge when you're reflecting? Because we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We don't know everything. We can make mistakes. And we probably make them repeatedly. Yes? Fear, but without the... Fear with an F, yes. Fear stops us from reflecting, because we don't want to peel that onion and find out something that we really didn't want to find out about ourselves. So we kind of like hide behind the facade and pretend everything is OK. That's where you get into, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I don't play one on TV. But that's when you get into mental, mental well-being. That's when you get into mental health is when you don't take the time to, to reflect and think about, think about things because you're pushing everything under the rug, pushing everything under the rug, pretending everything is OK, because you're never taking the time to stop and think. How many remember being in a timeout? Come on, raise your hand. I want to see every hand raised here. How many remember being in a timeout? Do you know what a timeout is? It's a time for you to pause and reset. It's a time for you as a child to stop and think about what you did and hopefully realize that what you did wasn't the right thing. That's what reflection is all about. Oops, I moved too fast, actually. Let's stay on this one. That's what reflection really is all about. It's that pause and reset. It's that sitting with yourself quietly, not in a loud room with lots of music and friends around. Reflection takes effort. And it takes you being with yourself and comfortable with yourself to have a real conversation about what's going on and why things happened. And with reflection comes self-awareness. Remember at the beginning when I talked about what words, what, people, what words people describe me with and then how I think about myself and the words I would describe myself with? That's where reflection comes in. That's where self-awareness and confidence start to build for you. And when we reflect, we begin to see things through a very different lens than the one that we typically look through. If you're wearing rosy colored lenses, all you're going to see is rosy colors around you. Everything's going to be great. But when you take those lenses and actually look and reflect, you are actually really beginning to understand where you need to make improvements and how you can move forward with that. And reflection helps us set boundaries. I cannot tell you when I was younger how many times I said yes to things that I really didn't want to do, 
whether it was job, whether it was with friends, because I wanted, I wanted to be, a, I was a people pleaser. I wanted people to like me, and I felt if I didn't do what they asked me to do, people were gonna stop liking me. And so when you reflect, you begin to set boundaries. You begin to learn what's acceptable for you and what's not. And those boundaries shift as you mature, as you grow. What's acceptable for you today, what was acceptable for me when I was your age, is very different than what's acceptable for me today. Because with self-awareness, you realize what your worth is. And when you know what your value is, no one can then value you differently. No one can say, oh no, you're okay, it's all right, you can keep doing this. Because you know what your self-worth is. And that comes from that self-awareness. And the last one I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna leave you with on reflection is following up on what I just said. How many things are you saying yes to, which in turn, what are you saying no to? Because it's taking your time to do the things that you said yes to. Go back to that 1440 and look at the things that you have on there. Things that you're saying yes to that you, you really don't want to do, but you feel obligated or you, know, you want Joe to like you so you actually end up doing it even though you didn't really want to. That's a powerful moment when you realize that when I say yes to this, that means I'm saying no to that. And it could be anything. It could be a job. It could be a significant other. It could be a trip. It could be whatever. When you say yes to something, you're actually saying no to something else. And what people also don't realize is taking no action is actually an action, by the way. Think about that one. All right, the last homework that we do, and we're actually coming up on time. Gosh, sorry, guys. Um, when you're reflecting, these are some of the questions that you should ask yourself. What happened? What did I do? Did I cause this? Is there something else I could have done better? Keeping a journal with reflection is so helpful because you can go back in time and see. You can start to notice trends. Are you doing the same thing and then reflecting and not making changes in your actions? If you don't have that record, you lose that track and you lose the ability to figure out, am I just in the same cycle doing the same thing over and over again? So definitely start a journal if you don't have one already. And when you're reflecting on things, ask yourself some of those questions. This last one is one of my favorites. Can I do this better next time? What would I do differently and can I do it better next time? Especially when it's something hard and it's something that disappointed you. How do you get over that? What is it that you're gonna do what are the controls that you're gonna put in, in place so that you can do better next time? All right, final thoughts. I know we're all holding our breath sometimes. We're waiting for that other shoe to fall. The sky is falling. You know what? It may be, but in the meantime, grant yourself some grace. Life is hard. These are hard times, really. Try to, choose, try to be positive and kind. Positivity and kindness goes a long way. Make sure that you learn to set boundaries. And sometimes instead of saying no, say not now. Or instead of saying yes, yes but not now. Embrace your beginner's mind. Keep that openness. Be self-aware. Really know who you are and what you want your legacy to be. Push yourself out of your comfort zone. I've been doing this for several years, and this is still not my comfort zone to stand here in front of people. But you have to do that to get growth. Find ways to silence your, your you know, I've, I've become friends with her. She's a good girl, you know. She has, she has my best interest in heart, kind of, and I listen to her sometimes, but I've learned to tell her to stay quiet every now and then. And try to reinvent yourself. And by that, I mean learn something new. Someone once told me that they try to learn something new every single day. 
that's a tall order. I don't think I'm going to do that. But try to learn something new once a week, whether it's reading a book, searching on, 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 a, on a topic that you don't really know a lot about. Again, go back to that open mind. Go back to that beginner's mind. And just keep reinventing yourself. I lied. Final, final thoughts. Remember those first three questions? What is working for me right now? That plays into the gratitude. What is not working for me? And what am I missing? That works into your self-awareness. What can I do better? That's your curiosity and your action. I promised you some resources. Again, if you're interested, if you've got a phone, you can take a, a screenshot of this. I'm happy to send it to you. I don't know if you're going to provide them with the, with the presentation. These are all great books. These are all great resources. Um, you can subscribe to newsletters. You can follow these people on LinkedIn. Um, they have tons of content that is really, really helpful. Those first two, Saboteur Assessment and Clifton 34 Assessment, those are great for learning who you are, for self-awareness. And I'm going to show you them. I'm going to show you my results. So I took, this is my Clifton 34. I took this. This is probably about two years ago. I typically do it once a year. The Clifton 34 strengths has 34 different strengths. These are not weaknesses. Just because this is number 32 or 34, that's not a weakness. It's just these are my strengths. This is where I'm really good. I always loved the woo. Means I, I'm a good connector. I communicate well with people. Communication, futuristic, strategic, re relator. They all fall into four different categories. Under executing, under influencing, relationship building, and strategic thinking. And so what you, with the Clifton 34 gives you the idea of how do you use your top strengths to really leverage and, and bring up those less, where you're less strong, if you will. This is not free, but I think it's worth um, spending money at some point, especially as you start to go into your career. This is, there's some companies that actually run this as part of their recruitment. They want to know where you fit. What kind of strengths do you bring to the table? And this is the saboteur assessment. This I took a long time ago. Um, this is, a, this is free, it's online, um, and it takes about 10, 15 minutes, it's not long, 30 questions, and it basically tells you what's stopping you. How do you self-sabotage? And back then, surprise, my number one was I was a pleaser. I, want, I would do anything for others at my own expense. Somebody wanted me to do a, a you know, to fix their program for them, I would do it, and then I would be up until 3, 4 o'clock in the morning working on my stuff because I wanted to be a pleaser. Those are really interesting to do and to learn about them. Um, I was never, ever coming up as a victim. I love that. But, you know, there's some people who victimize themselves. So we were in St. Croix about a month ago or so. And we came across this, and I, I so loved it. It was actually all on the ground, and my husband and I, he helped me put it together. And it says, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Thank you, everybody. I'm here to answer any questions that you have.